that fought during four and a half years against the whole world will always in the end come out top. Kaiser Bill speaking from exile. Stripped of his power, but still the unrepentant German nationalist. The man held responsible for sending millions to their deaths in the First World War, who tried unsuccessfully to conquer Europe and bring the British Empire to its knees. In the years immediately after the First World War, I believe that my grandfather agonized over his responsibility for the German defeat. Kaiser Wilhelm, the Emperor of Germany in his heyday. He rather ungraciously dismisses his second most senior admiral. Wilhelm's withered left arm, which caused him so much distress in his childhood, is barely noticeable. It's wartime and his forces are occupying Belgium, parts of France, and huge swathes of Russia and Eastern Europe. In his heart of hearts, I think he was a weak and insecure man who tried to compensate by being outspoken. During his 30 years on the throne, Wilhelm saw himself as the personification of German nationalism. The unification of Germany in 1871, which he'd witnessed as a boy, had released a wave of national self-confidence. For me, Germany was the Kaiser. And when we saw him, we could not contain our excitement and would shout, hurrah. The Kaiser was the highest being in existence, a world star on the same level as God or the Pope. He looked good, had a good figure, was vigorous and big. He had a moustache like this. Everyone, including my father, had one, with wax to make it stand stiffly. Wilhelm grew up in Potsdam, the home for generations of the Royal House of Prussia, the Hohenzollerns. He was born in 1859. His English mother, Vicky, was Queen Victoria's eldest daughter. She had a long and very painful labor because her infant was in the breech position. To deliver the baby, the German doctor had sharply yanked down his arms, which damaged the nerves in his neck. Wilhelm's left arm was unable to grow or function properly. One must take in consideration that even today, if you have a disability, it's a great problem. But at that time, to have a disability was a disaster. The people were not called dis disabled, but they were simply called cripples. And to the people of, of that time, of the time of my great-grandfather, he was, in fact, a cripple. And a cripple in his position, being the future emperor of Germany, being the head of the army, that was a complete catastrophe. Vicky found it difficult to love a son with such an imperfection. She desperately wanted doctors to heal him, but their treatments were both ineffective and painful. So, growing up in the royal palace and park was not a happy time for the future Kaiser. In letters to her mother, Vicky depicted how Wilhelm's head had started to lean towards the stronger shoulder. To stop this, he was made to wear a brace. It didn't work, and when he was six, the doctor straightened his head by cutting a tendon in his neck. Vicky wrote, Wilhelm behaved very quietly and without complaint. Afterwards, he wept a little. My great-grandfather was brought up to cope with this disability. He learned to swim, he learned to shoot, 
and he learned to ride. Shooting with his one good arm, sometimes with no support, became one of Wilhelm's favorite sports. But in everyday life, of course, he was quite handicapped. That meant that during dinners or luncheons, he had a footman behind him who uh, had to cut his meal. Or his dinner or luncheon partner had to cut for him the meal. Later on, he used a sort of combined fork and knife that was one instrument, where he could, uh, at the same time, cut and have a fork. Vicky directed her son's political education with the same fervor that she applied to his disability. She impressed on him how backward Germany was, politically and socially, compared with England. And her hopes that first her husband, the crown prince, and later Wilhelm, would put this right. Wilhelm not only rejected his mother's progressive English values, he rejected her as well. In 1888, while his father lay dying after a reign of only a few months, Wilhelm surrounded the palace with loyal troops. At the moment of death, he searched his mother's quarters for evidence that she was conspiring to reform and so weaken the monarchy. The new Kaiser, he was 29, had no intention of handing over any of his imperial powers to the German parliament, or the ape house, as he later called it. He intended to rule as well as to reign. Yet there was still a side of Wilhelm which felt drawn to England. The feeling was to evolve into a rivalry a wish to match England and surpass her. The English attraction began with his childhood visits to the Isle of Wight, to his grandmother's retreat at Osborne. Queen Victoria indulged her eldest grandson, and a portrait of an angelic Wilhelm with his parents and sister had pride of place in her dining room. As an adult, Wilhelm was to talk about that dear old home of Osborne. I think his feeling about England centered very much on the English royal family, because the Kaiser himself, he felt himself being a member as well as of the royal family as, of the, uh, fam uh, as, uh, as a member of the House of Hohenzollern. From the roof of Osborne, it's possible to see the Solent. One of Wilhelm's visits coincided with Cow's Week. His interest aroused, he was invited to join the Royal Yacht Squadron. Soon, he was sponsoring his own cup. Wilhelm always competed in the big class, especially against his uncle, the Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VII. The two did not get on. Wilhelm was relentlessly competitive, and he was always complaining to his British aristocratic friends about fat old whales, as he called him, consorting with rich people he considered common. His more memorable put-downs soon got around. My father told a, a story of Sir Thomas Lipton. Now, Sir Thomas Lipton was a great yachtsman, a very rich man, and he'd started the Lipton's grocery chain. Somebody asked the Kaiser, where the king was. And the Kaiser replied, he's gone boating with his grocer. No grocers were invited to the German equivalent of Cow's Week. Wilhelm developed another obsession during his English visits, the Royal Navy. And he was thrilled when his grandmother made him an admiral of the British fleet. Fancy wearing the uniform of Nelson, Wilhelm remarked, it's enough to make one quite giddy. The important event in 1896 was 
the arrival in Cowes of USS Chicago with under the command of Captain Alfred Thayer Marne. Alfred Thayer Marne was a great theorist and he'd written a book called The Impact of Sea Power on History. And the Kaiser thought this was the best thing he'd ever read. He said, I, I committed it to memory. The book became his Bible. And in 1897, Wilhelm announced a massive naval building program. The Kaiser wanted to turn his country from a continental power into a sea power, a world power. He said Germany was entitled to what he called a place in the sun. Wilhelm was challenging Britain's supremacy of the seas. In the early years of the century, the British responded by making alliances with France and Russia, who also felt threatened by Wilhelm's power. Europe was beginning to divide into two hostile camps. In early 1901, after news reached him that Queen Victoria's health was failing, Wilhelm came hurrying over to Osborne. He joined his uncle and other members of the royal family in her bedroom and was helping the doctor to support her on her pillow when she died. My grandfather had a my grandfather used to talk with great pride of how Queen Victoria died in his arms. He saw it as evidence of her affection and love for him, though at the time she was hardly in a position to resist. The British public responded warmly to Wilhelm's presence. The Times wrote, your English tears for love of England's queen, England will not forget. The cheers which greeted the Kaiser on the London streets touched him, but he already saw himself as Britain's rival. My great-grandfather Kaiser had a very ambivalent attitude towards England in the fact that he wanted to be admired as a normal English gentleman, and on the other hand, being feared as a Prussian warlord. But there was yet another side to this complex man, which was to cause the greatest embarrassment in his life. Despite his bravura and obvious enjoyment of the privileges which came with power, Wilhelm was a lonely and uncertain figure. But before he came to the throne, He'd met a man who appealed to him in a way that his friends from the officer class and the British aristocracy did not. It was a fateful choice. Philip Zu Eulenburg was a sensitive, artistic, and in some ways unconventional man who appealed to Wilhelm's softer, more romantic side. My grandfather composed the Rosenlieder. He had a very beautiful voice. He sang and composed other songs, some of which were dedicated to the Kaiser. Of course, the Kaiser liked that a lot. He was the friend. He was the one who stood by the Kaiser through thick and thin. In the end, the Kaiser could scarcely do or decide anything without consulting my grandfather. His name was Philip, but the Kaiser called him Philly and would use du, the intimate form of address. The friendship was to haunt him later. Wilhelm's other great recreation was taking long cruises on his yacht, the Hohenzollern. He was an early practitioner of German travel mania.
No women were allowed on these trips. And Wilhelm used to delight in playing very childish games on the senior government officials and military men accompanying him. The sea was rough, and many of them were feeling seasick. The Kaiser spotted that. Using his right arm, which was well developed, he suddenly punched the chief of his naval cabinet in the stomach. The Kaiser added, any minute now, whereupon the Admiral staggered to the railing and made his offering to Neptune. Sometimes Wilhelm's pranks and the eagerness of senior officers to oblige him got out of control. Such was the case of General Count Hülsen Hazler. The general dressed up in a pink tutu and danced a little ballet. Suddenly, he dropped dead from a stroke. Everyone had trouble getting his costume off and his general's uniform back on. They couldn't send him to a mortuary, half naked in a little tutu. That scandal didn't reach the public. Another one did. In 1906, a Berlin magazine accused Philipp Eulenburg, a married man with eight children, of being a homosexual. After a delay, Eulenburg sued the magazine. But the evidence produced in court resulted in Eulenburg being put on trial for homosexuality. The terrible thing was that the Kaiser, the great friend, immediately dropped my grandfather. But arrogant as he was, the Kaiser had promised that the moment Philly was found innocent, he would collect him from court with a coach and six horses. But Philly was not able to clear his name. He developed a frightful heart condition and the trial was suspended. Philly was carried out of court on a stretcher and the Kaiser, the great friend, didn't lift a finger. And the Kaiser, his friend, had not rührt. This terrible court case was played up not so much with the intention of hitting Eulenburg as of striking at my grandfather and suggesting we were being led by a homosexual. This was such a serious political matter that my grandfather felt that a continuation of this friendship would endanger both state and monarchy. There was no evidence that Wilhelm was homosexual. Quite apart from a wife and seven children, he had had in his early days a string of mistresses and two illegitimate children. Philip's broken health prevented him from going back to court to clear his name. Wilhelm never spoke to his bosom friend again. Despite Wilhelm sacrificing his friend, the smell of scandal hung around and weakened him politically. Throughout his reign, Wilhelm felt threatened by the growth of the socialists, who by 1912 had become the largest single party in the Reichstag. They made no secret of their wish to clip his wings. Wilhelm even warned his soldiers that he might have to order them to shoot their own brothers and fathers when putting down socialist disturbances. Nineteen twelve was also the year when he realized that his attempts to turn Germany into a superpower had provoked three countries Britain, Russia, and France 
to ally against him. The Kaiser told his army chiefs in December 1912 that they should prepare for war. The best time for Germany to fight would be in about 18 months' time. A few months later, Wilhelm invited the crowned heads of Europe for his daughter's wedding. Many of the monarchs were relatives of his and were soon to become his enemies. Wilhelm's cousin, King George V of England, arrived sporting a Prussian helmet. The king's secretary was alarmed to hear from Wilhelm that a European war was imminent. Like his cousins in Vienna and St. Petersburg, Wilhelm was riding the twin tigers of nationalism and domestic unrest. This was to be the last gala performance of the old regime. In June 1914, Wilhelm was in Kiel, where the German fleet was awaiting a British contingent on a courtesy visit. Sailors from the two countries were to test each other's strengths on the water. The Kaiser was invited to a reception on the British flagship, and Sir Horace Rumbold, the number two at the British Embassy in Berlin, was also present. He turned up wearing his full fig, as to say, a morning coat, uh, top hat. He thought it was appropriate when he was going to meet the Emperor, the Kaiser. And uh, when he approached the Kaiser and was introduced to him, the Kaiser said, if I see you wearing that hat again, I'll smash it in. One doesn't wear a tall hat on ship. The Kaiser was enjoying his role, I think, because he was, strictly speaking, the commanding British officer present. He was an admiral of the British fleet. He was on the British flagship. He's flying his flag as admiral of the fleet. Two days later, on June the 28th, Wilhelm had invited the children of his senior officers to a tea party on the Imperial yacht. Among them was Christa Schilling. It's wrong. The Kaiser had invited all the young people for coffee and cakes and flowers for a lovely party on his boat. The Kaiser was standing nearby and nodded to us from time to time, but he was busy, so he let us get on with the party. Just when we were really enjoying ourselves, there was suddenly a call for quiet and a telegram was read out. It was about Sarajevo and the murder there. We were astonished and didn't know what to make of it. Then we were told we would have to leave because the murder was terribly serious and there could be war. Wilhelm was shocked by the assassination of the Austrian crown prince. He was sure the Serbs were responsible. He promised Austria, Germany's only ally, full support for an attack on Serbia. The Austrians sent an ultimatum, which they were sure the Serbians would not accept. Their conciliatory reply gave Wilhelm a let out. He was no longer sure he wanted war. On the 28th of July, he read the reply, of the, the Serbian reply, and he said, he said to his chancellor, well, this is a, a, moral, a great moral victory for Vienna and there's and every reason for war drops away. And he, he ordered immediate uh, talks, me, uh, mediation talks between Austria and, and Serbia. He told, the, he told his chancellor to do that. And what did he do? He, not, he didn't do anything. 
He simply ignored the order of the, uh, the Kaiser. So Germany's political and military leaders encouraged Austria to attack Serbia, even though they knew it would provoke Serbia's ally, Russia, into mobilizing. The timetables and plans, worked out with Wilhelm's agreement before 1914, began to override his panicky attempts to limit the war. The prospect of a world war frightened the Kaiser and brought him into conflict with his army chief, von Moltke. On August the 1st, in this room, Wilhelm signed the order for general mobilization. But a few hours later, he excitedly told Moltke that Britain would remain neutral if Germany didn't attack France so it would be best to leave France alone. An astonished Moltke reminded the Kaiser that the plan had required Germany to knock out France before attacking Russia, and that millions of troops were already on their way to the French frontier. To turn them around now would be disastrous. My great-grandfather declared war on, on France because he was urged by his generals that the time well, I'm, I'm not a, a military man, but uh, and uh, the, the Kaiser was put before the question, either you, de uh, you declare war now or you, the, the, the war um, would, be, would be lost. Wilhelm gave in only after a new report made clear that Britain would not stay out of the war. An exhausted Kaiser summoned Moltke. Now do as you please. I don't care either way. Germany was at war with Russia, France, and Britain. Es muss denn das Schwert nun entscheiden. Mitten im Frieden über Feld und der Feind. Der Kaiser war auf dem The Kaiser appeared on the balcony and spoke to the hundred thousand people standing between the Schloss and the Brandenburg Gate. Between the Schloss and the Brandenburger Tor. Then I rushed home and told my parents, full of enthusiasm. Wilhelm had told his departing troops, you will be home before the leaves have fallen from the trees. His generals had assured him that France would be defeated in 40 days. But it was soon clear that the war would last much longer. Later, Wilhelm would say he lost sleep thinking of the huge sacrifices Germans made during the war. But in the early years, he reveled in repeating bloodthirsty stories of piles of corpses six feet high. He never visited the trenches, where two million Germans and as many French and British were to die. The worst memory is gas. If you didn't get your mask on quick, and I mean quick, you'd had it. You began to cough and slowly suffocate. The tongue sticks right out, the eyes protrude, and then foam comes out of the mouth. Terrible. It's horrible to see men die from gas. War is always ghastly, when men have to die, many of them so young. My grandfather obviously bore the final responsibility as supreme commander of the army. But he had but he gave the chiefs of the general staff a virtual free hand. So you could say that he rather withdrew from his responsibility.
It was called the Kaiser's War, but both strategy and management of the war and eventually political decisions were in the hands of the generals. By the summer of 1916, Wilhelm's role had become largely symbolic. But there were exceptions. He did, for instance, dig in his heels over naval operations. The man who built his fleet, Admiral Tirpitz, wanted to use it against the British. Contrary to the recommendations of Tirpitz, my grandfather, the Kaiser was reluctant for his precious fleet to face danger. He wanted to keep the fleet up his sleeve as the ace of trumps at the peace negotiations. The only battle between the main British and German fleets at Jutland in 1916 had not been planned by Wilhelm. The Kaiser's force sank more ships and killed more men. The spell of Trafalgar is broken, Wilhelm declared. In fact, the tight British naval blockade of Germany was not affected by Jutland. By the end of 1917, the Kaiser's subjects were living on a diet of root vegetables. They called it the turnip winter. By September 1918, the Kaiser's Germany was beginning to unravel. On the Western Front, thousands of Germans were being taken prisoner. In October, the Allies made it clear that the removal of Wilhelm, the symbol of German militarism, was an essential precondition for peace. Berlin was in turmoil, with soldiers and workers calling for revolution. A new reforming government which was trying to negotiate with the Allies suggested to Wilhelm that he should abdicate. The Kaiser's adjutant heard his master's response. When the Kaiser was asked to abdicate, he was completely against it. He took the point of view that he is the German emperor and nobody could send him away. On the other side, if there were problems inside Germany by troops rebelling, he would take other troops he thought he could rely upon, go back to Germany, bring things in order, and shoot the traitors if necessary. Wilhelm had earlier left Berlin because he thought he would be safer with troops at the front. But whilst he was traveling, soldiers shouted at him for the first time in his life. They accused him of prolonging the war. It was to the little Belgian town of Spa in the Ardennes that Wilhelm came for help. Here were the German headquarters and the generals he could rely on. They met on the morning of November the 9th. First to speak was General Groener, number two in the military hierarchy. General Groener told the Kaiser, my great-grandfather, that the German army would go back to Germany quietly under the command of the generals, but not under the command of his majesty. The Kaiser immediately replied that he wanted to have written proof of that statement. The, the generals couldn't produce that. And then the Kaiser asked, and what about the oath sworn to me and the colors? And the General Groener replied, that doesn't mean a thing anymore. Wilhelm went into the gardens of the chateau where he was staying to think the unthinkable. Should he abdicate? While he was pondering, a phone call from Berlin brought the news that the government had already announced his abdication and proclaimed a republic. He sat for two hours in his chair thinking, smoking one cigarette after the other and saying nothing. Late in the afternoon, Wilhelm and his staff decamped to the Imperial train. They were worried that disaffected soldiers might seize him. After all, 
revolutionaries had murdered his cousin, Tsar Nicholas, a few months earlier. After hours of agonizing about what to do, Wilhelm decided to leave. At five in the morning, the train pulled out. A few miles on, it stopped. Fearing they might meet retreating troops, Wilhelm's party transferred into waiting cars. The Kaiser urged his accompanying officers to equip themselves with guns. So in the car, everyone had a gun between his knees, just for just in case. Close to the Belgian-Dutch border, the cavalcade ran into a retreating German unit. The Kaiser crossed the border in eight smart cars with armed guards. I can see it now. He whizzed past and I saw him very briefly. It was sad to see him going, but also good. Good. Because it meant that the war was over. That was important for us soldiers, as we were sick and tired of the war. Now we knew we could at last return home. When Wilhelm's party reached Eisden on the Dutch border, they parked their cars at the station. The Dutch government was surprised by his arrival and had to decide very quickly what to do about such a controversial figure. It became public in the neighborhood that the Kaiser was there. So members of the population, but also Belgians, tried to get up to the station. They succeeded in getting near him and were also yelling at him and screaming and threatening. The Belgians wanted revenge for the long German occupation of their country. Wilhelm was glad to get back into the Imperial train, which had now caught up with him. The Kaiser discussed this situation with my father when he was sitting in the train. He then suddenly said, look, people have disliked me a long time all over the world. They're saying nasty things of me, about me. Uh, I couldn't care less. It doesn't harm me anymore. The next morning, the Dutch government granted Wilhelm asylum. He was sent to stay with a noble Dutch family. The Kaiser came in, he said two things. Please give me a good cup of English tea, and I don't want to disturb you at all. I want to join family life. It was November the 11th. Wilhelm was now officially in exile. On the same day, fighting stopped. The war was over. As the Kaiser's once proud battalions limped back home, tired, defeated, and depressed, Germans could now take stock of the fact that Wilhelm had gone. We were glad to be rid of the Kaiser. The news of his abdication was shattering at first, but then everyone said he caused the war, he lost the war. Thank God he's gone. Gott sei Dank, er ist weg. Feelings in the Allied countries about Wilhelm were also running high. In Britain, there were calls for him to be hanged as a war criminal. Wilhelm retreated to a house he bought in the little Dutch town of Dorn. He knew that the Netherlands, which had been neutral during the war, would not hand him over to the Allies. Visitors came to see him in his cage. Over the years, they arrived in their thousands from Germany to get a glimpse of him in exile. I always tried to cheer him up, but it was terribly difficult. After all, one should not forget that the Kaiser was in exile, with barbed wire around the property and a Dutch guard at the gate. This was to be Wilhelm's home for over 20 years, a quarter of his life. 
Dawn was modest compared with Wilhelm's palaces, but he was not short of money. He still drew a handsome income from properties in Germany. The Dutch banned Wilhelm from any political activity, but he was allowed visitors. For his new life, Wilhelm rearranged his facial hair. The aggressive, upturned moustache of the warlord was replaced by the mellower image of that other role he loved to play, the country gentleman. The former Kaiser also had more time for his family. His grandson, Wilhelm Karl, remembers his summer holidays in Dawn. He had the great talent of making each one of us feel that he or she was the favorite grandchild. That was lovely. The saddle which Wilhelm Karl's grandfather brought with him from Potsdam and used to sit on at his desk is still in the study. And as Wilhelm Karl discovered, so are some of his papers. It's my Christmas card to my grandfather. It says, Dear Grandpa, Happy Christmas 1933. From your obedient grandson, Wilhelm Karl. It's the Imperial yacht attending naval exercises. I'm touched that he kept it. It's not that artistic. The 11-year-old had picked two of the great passions of his grandfather's life, the Navy and the sea. The nearest the former Admiral of the Atlantic, as he once styled himself, got to the sea during his exile were local excursions the Dutch government allowed him to make once things had settled down. Wilhelm was unrepentant about the past, as this newly discovered interview reveals. I absolutely believe in the future of my country. A nation that fought during four and a half years against the whole world. And if America hadn't come in, would have beaten the Allies, will always in the end come out top. Wilhelm was also bitter. Not for the first time in his life, he picked on the Jews. In a letter blaming the Jews for his abdication, he said, let no German rest until these parasites have been destroyed and exterminated. Anti-Semitism and aggressive nationalism were key ingredients of the cocktail Hitler was offering German voters in the early 30s. Although the former Kaiser's views overlapped with Hitler's, he was shocked by Hitler's atheism and disdainful of his vulgarity. But he was very keen to get his throne back and was strongly supported by his second wife, Hermina, a widowed German princess. She approached the Nazis even before they gained power. Georg Martin Wunderlich was her secretary. The Empress showed herself to be very open to National Socialism. She wanted to contact the Nazis so she could talk to Hitler directly. She wanted to convince Hitler to put her husband, the Kaiser, back on the throne. Zu bewegen, ihren Mann, den Kaiser, wieder auf den Thron zu bringen. Hermine succeeded in getting Hitler to send Göring, his chief lieutenant, to Dawn. But the talks got nowhere. Hitler was never seriously interested in restoring Wilhelm to his throne. Eight years later, in 1940, Hitler gained in a matter of weeks what the Kaiser had failed to achieve in four and a half years. France defeated, 
and Britain brushed off the continent. Wilhelm Karl, now a conscript in Hitler's army, came to dawn for lunch. My grandfather was enthusiastic about this victory because he still felt very close to this army, particularly with the higher ranking officers whom he had known well before and during the First World War. He knew their regiments. He had an amazing memory. In a way, he regarded the victory as a testimony to his training. Wilhelm sent a telegram congratulating Hitler on his victory. Though quoting the Lutheran hymn, Now thank we all our God, was hardly the Fuhrer's style. The former Kaiser was to spend the last year of his life as an unimportant subject of Hitler's Reich. He was to go to his grave as a major promoter of the First World War and the man who stifled the growth of democracy in Germany. He inherited one of the most advanced countries in Europe and left it ruined. His failures were spectacular, disastrous and bloody and must outweigh the good which some people detected in him. Of course, he knew that according to our constitution and old Prussian traditions, the responsibility for everything was his. And he kept asking himself, where have I failed? What have I done wrong? What could I have done differently? The last German Kaiser died in 1941 at the age of 82. The devastating effects of shell shock are explored in the first of a new three-part series tomorrow on 4 at 8 o'clock.